So first of all, I want to thank Lika, Tamta, Maya for inviting me here. Anna no for your welcome at the airport yesterday. And this invitation means a lot to me. And your recognition honors me so much that I'm not sure I'm deserving or about to meet your queer expectations. Um, needless to say, I'm particularly honored to present alongside Paula Baqueta, whose work has been immensely influential in thinking through the intersection of coloniality, class, gender, and sexuality, and how to contextualize and situate my work without reproducing hegemonic power. Um, preparing for the queer forum, I found myself freaking out because the article that um, has been translated is something that I've written a while ago. And I felt that there is always so much that needs to be said in addition to what's written in the article, acknowledged and debated. Um, and there's enough time since, as Jasbir Puar says, we live in paranoid times and risk management economies that have the tendency to suppress creative political thinking in favor of immediate solutions. So I like to think of this queer forum as the opposite of paranoid time, but rather as an in-between break to stop, to breathe, to reflect, to see and hear each other, and perhaps conspire on how to abuse the temporary hospitality of neoliberal and colonial institutions to devise methods and line of flight that lead away from the straight and linear path to seek and move into new directions and possibilities. For nearly three decades now, we are witnessing the folding of queer bodies into heteronormativity and modes of reproductive respectability curated around demands for rights such as gay marriage, adoption, military service, and parades. LGBT movements have come to embrace the nation, nationalism, and the family by appealing for uh, support, just as these structures are being dismantled by neoliberal economic reforms. That these trajectories overlap and inform one another is not accidental. Effective and familial economies replacing redistributive ones. Nor is it accidental that queer liberatory struggles that were generated by queer and trans people of color in the US primarily were appropriated and subsequently transformed into NGOs and civil society networks. Just as liberal governmentality was transitioning into non-governmentality, whereby the delivery of social services that the state once was responsible for are now contracted and delegated to non-governmental organizations. Like corporations that expanded their operations through former socialist market liberalization, exploiting cheap labor and cheaper bodies, EU and US gays expanded their operations along with myriad other saving industries that emerged to globalize and preach liberal humanism. Framing both problems and providing the solutions at once, traveling gay saviors came en masse in post-socialist spaces, delivering instructions of how to reach post-homophobic times. That certain homosexual bodies have come to be integrated, accepted, and acknowledged, however, is not an affirmation that we are approaching or are already, already leaving in post-homophobic times, but that homophobia has never been more pervasive and normalized. That as the regulation of gender and sexuality is increasingly guided by normalization as opposed to repression, it has attempted to erase alternative histories, subjectivities, and futurities of being, becoming, and belonging. That models of homosexuality that celebrate heteronormative institutions and seek their approval is not a deviation or dethroning of heterosexuality, but it's recalibration and reorganization through respectable gay rights. In this sense, the universalization of template LGBT liberation models, along with grammars and vocabularies of individualism, backed by large political interests of post-Cold War market expansions, and emboldened Euro-American gays to find and save post-socialist and post-colonial queers, to advocate their governments on behalf of second and third world gays, to intervene as necessary, because in the words of Randy Berry, Obama's special envoy 
for global gay rights, U.S. commitments to the advancement of LGBT human rights, quote, is not just a moral necessity, which it is, but also because it's a strategic imperative for the United States to identify friendly countries from detractor countries. Twinks for Trump, cops for Daddy Mike Pence, and the outrage that Trump could possibly prevent trans people from serving in the military and therefore prevent their privilege of serving the U.S. Army in the bombing of Yemen, of droning of Afghanistan, and the neo-colonial occupation of Kosovo are just the latest manifestations of a long-in-the-making gay fascist cocktail. But nowhere were these homo-nationalist and homo-racist imaginaries richer than in post-Cold War Europe. In Europe, such homo-nationalist imaginaries operate through what Jean Harital Ward calls queer lovers and hateful others, whereby affluent gay German hipsters who gentrify migrant neighborhoods call for the intervention of the state in their sanitization practices as injured homosexuals under threat by migrant homophobes. It is not accidental that Berlin, the queerest capital of Europe, has built its brand through migrant cleansing of Gastrabeiter neighborhoods, of guest workers from second and the third world, and through surveillance and policing of those behaviors and bodies which are projected as a threat to proper German queers. Along with the rainbow flag, these attitudes and the politics they generate are then exported further east with the EU Eastern expansion. Here, they're packaged as a post-socialist Europeanization reform. The role of LGBT rights and protection is expanded to save gays from their own societies, displacing questions of social and economic justice to questions of recognition and visibility. Gays come to be projected as helpless victims whose marginalization was articulated through Orientalist mixtures of fantasy and fiction that identify homophobia as cultural, religious, and traditional backwardness of our societies, or as a result of our half a century socialist misalignment from Europe. Queers who sought to complicate or resist this binary discourse of modern, backward, secular religious were usually sidelined and silenced by an ever-aggressive, growing pro eu secular bloc, whose single most important goal became the constant reassurance offered to the EU to ascertain their questioned Europeanness, inventing enemies and fighting them, translating concepts and words that were not only incomprehensible to us, but to the Eurogays that delivered them. So in my presentation tonight, I want to address some aspects of these post-socialist politics of sexuality and the ways in which they continue to propel homo-nationalist agendas across post-socialist spaces. In the first part, I will expand on the concept of homo-nationalism and the ways in which homo-nationalism is inserted into the fears, fantasies, failures, and futurities of post-socialist societies. Specifically, I will talk about three main trajectories where queer bodies are deployed to realign their societies towards Europe and capitalism. Bordering through queerness, racialization through queerness, and rehabilitation through queerness. In the second part, I will share some reflections on the problems and possibilities of post-socialist queer solidarities from our shared experience as activists working in various Balkan queer collectives and networks. Two events dominated worldviews in the last year on the question of sexuality in former socialist spaces. The execution of gay men in Chechnya and the appointment of the first lesbian prime minister in any post-socialist country. Most of these debates were driven by Western shock and disbelief that in Chechnya, gay people can be killed. The outpouring of sympathy was unseen. The EU Parliament and EU Commission were discussing how to intervene in this crisis. In the borders of Europe, however, had just foreclosed the fate of refugees at their southeastern border, where 2007 recorded the highest refugee deaths, reaching the average of 100 refugee deaths per month. Chancellor Merkel and Marcon, the president of France, 
pressured Putin personally to intervene in Chechnya, in keeping, as they said, with European values. The gay Twitter rally wrote about honor killings, about the homophobic and mad dictator Kadyrov, declaring that there are no gays in Chechnya, about the Islamist nature of homophobia in Chechnya. The hysteria was unprecedented, just as daily deaths of refugees had normalized to such an extent that they no longer deserved attention. In the meantime, as Syrian refugees traveled through the Balkan routes, they were beaten, criminalized, pushed back, hunted down by vigilantes, and killed frequently at border crossings. The Bulgarian Prime Minister Boyko Borisov praised the vigilante boys by declaring that protecting the countries and Europe's borders was a joint effort between them and the government. Serbia, Macedonia, Albania received border training, monitoring and surveillance support from the EU in closing down the Balkan route in exchange for eventual EU membership. The security cordon encircling the eastern frontier of the EU were all awarded with counter-terrorist and counter-radicalization training, funds and programs. Rather they had any or not was not the question, finding them meant both EU cash and support. All these combined processes proved an opportunity for post-socialist spaces and states to once and for all display their Europeanness and EU commitment. Those with more to compensate, like Serbia, went further by appointing a gay prime minister as the ultimate showcasing of its commitment to Europe. And the good news came this month when the EU Commission released a report that Montenegro and Serbia should be ready for membership by 2025. The rest of the countries left out of the Balkans are now Albania, Kosovo, Bosnia, and Macedonia, a Muslim ghetto surrounded by EU members. Speaking enviously on Serbia's clever pinkwashing, the Kosovo foreign minister was caught saying, quote, it pays to have gays, end quote. In these converging bordering assemblages through bio and necropolitical management of life and death, the EU sustains the racial politics of who lives and who dies, who passes and who doesn't, by investing in various queer economies that sustain and profit from drawing and sustaining borders. The geopolitical and body political borders that makes queer political formations and queer bodies the arbiters of what geographies and populations are marked for life and those marked for violence, exclusion, and death. Embedded in the geopolitical post-socialist coloniality, queers have become the embodiment of the border between proper and improper politics. Politics that align themselves to queer operate as the politics of the future, as the politics of life, as the politics of Europe designating the borders between queer bodies and left behind, marked as abstract on the other side of the border, animated by the politics of death and dying. So the geopolitics of bordering through queerness results in racialized desires that establishes a distinction between those bodies that are desirable and the destabilizing, debilitating, debilitating and damaged ones. In this context, that the third trajectory I want to talk about has to do with the post-socialist queerness as rehabilitative politics, in that queers come to rehabilitate the ailing, misaligning post-socialist patient and deliver it towards progress. In this Eurocentric worldview, the road to the EU and NATO is mapped out through the aff affirmation of queer bodies with resistance to such roads leading to political itineraries that violate queers. So in post-socialist geographies, queer bodies thus become the battleground of geopolitical realignments of Cold War 2.0 between those who claim queers as their foot soldiers in European and NATO expansion eastward and those who position themselves as the defenders of tradition through the death and destruction of queers as we have witnessed recently in, Se in Russia and Chechnya. In both instances, control over the queer body, rather by repression or heteronormalization, becomes the tool through which regimes communicate and negotiate their global political positions. 
Kadyrov's recent execution of gay men being an example of his proof of alliance to Russia, while also a show of force to increasingly radical movements at home who see him as a puppet caricature of Kremlin. Hunting gay bodies, therefore, allows him to settle domestic and global scores while restoring his political and possibly his fragile heterovirility. On the other hand, Serbia's appointment of a gay prime minister by a president who seeks to pinkwash his involvement in the Milosevic regime and re corroborate Serbia's commitment to Europe, especially in the midst of re-emerging Cold War spectacles where the interference of Russia in the Balkans is as mythical as the liberal outrage over Russia's involvement in U.S. election, being the example of post-socialist convergence of homonationalism with homophobia. Thus, in both instances, queer bodies are positioned or position themselves as geopolitical bodies, as borders through queerness. In this post-socialist scenario, LGBT politics either come to labor in, become part of, and to an extent legitimize U.S. and EU post-Cold War governing grammar of saving industries by acting as delineating border bodies, both metaphor met metaphorical and literal ones, of racialized political limits of where Europe ends, or they become the sacrificed bodies of those who supposedly are resisting post-Cold War, new Cold War. I want to argue that these expansions and bordering processes are not entirely new, but reinstallments and reworkings of 19th century imagined European racial geographies that reemerge after socialism under a new casing so as to anesthetize its links with imperial colonial Europe and its civilizing missions. In this sense, the template LGBT projects that arrive from Europe are already racialized and bordered and are deployed as rehabilitated assemblages into the body of post-socialist people whose whiteness, Europeanness, and straightness are understood as diluted and damaged by socialist past or proximity to non-European Islamic others. Queer rehabilitation calls for the kind of love for the nation that Europe approves of. LGBT rights projects that become part of this expansion not only aim to create acceptable queer subjects in the Euro-American homo and hetero norms, but to also divide redeemable white Europeans from irredeemable racial and class others. This brings me to a second point of the racialization through queerness that occurs in these European bordering processes as queer political formations become the premise and promise of EU integration. Georgia's ability to promote LGBT rights, for instance, even if minimally so, is illustrated through the exhibition of relentless homophobia of countries further south, east, and north of it. What racialized bordering technologies are deployed here on the bodies of queers? Because these acts of Euro progress are always racialized. Because unlike the Azeris or the Chechens or Russians, Georgians are real Europeans. They are the true Caucasians. These are racialized mythologies and racist myths that precede and accompany EU expansion eastwards, just as the EU claims to be colorblind. Protection of LGBT rights thus becomes a racialized enterprise that settles racial anxieties of borderland populations. Despite the fact that in these borderlands spaces, the erasure of racialized histories have gone hand in hand with the erasure of queer histories through Eurocentric organization of time and space, where everything that does not correspond to the myth of Europe and its memory is relegated as site of forgetfulness. All Eastern European nations have their own mythologies of defending Mother Europe from all sorts of Eastern barbaric invasions. Contemporary EU expansion projects are premised on these racist myths of Eastern threats 
from socialism, from Islam, from migrants, from the Chinese, and so forth, that sexuality and gender has been a key operating and orienting device here is not surprising, because it is through these histories and cultural productions, through these post-socialist spaces, that the gendered and sexualized Muslim and marginal body becomes the screen onto which European heteronormative masculinities are constructed in opposition to frail and questionable gender and sex of the racial other. And I say racialized and racial other because ethnic and religious minorities, as Inko Amre points out in the case of Hungary, is just another way for the state to erase and conceal its racist and racial violence. So how does this self-fashioning Europeanness and therefore whiteness of the Georgians, Croats, Romanians, Bulgarians, the Estonians, etc. conflates happy market gays with happy Europe at the price of borders being displaced further east, creating and to an extent completing a geopolitical Euro-Christian wholeness of the EU at the borders of the imagined Islamic other. In their pursuit of a clean Europe, a pure Europe as a whole, those who do not meet the criteria of Europeanists, especially Muslims and Roma, are met with constant purges, intimidation and violence, making their lives unbearable, so they leave, because this post-national vision of the EU cannot contain in its borderlands elements that it sees as weak links, just as it preaches multiculturalism at its core. And since the container of freedom is Europe, and Europe loves gays, gays become the rehabilitative injuncture, the pill to assure European orientations, seen in most post-socialist spaces as the healthy choice, the right path and the prosperous one. You should not hate gays because it's wrong to hate. You should not hate gays because it would make us seem less European, is the operating logic here. More importantly, perhaps, EU and US help for gays in post-socialist societies reifies the myth of European and American post-homophobic and post-racial temporality through a temporal break between those moving towards the future, guaranteed by the capitalistic understanding of individual freedom of choice, and those stuck in the ethnic, tribal, and socialist collective past. I want to call this the recalibration of race through homo emancipation. I will try to illustrate this with a couple of examples from the Balkans. For several years now, the US and the EU embassies sent gay men as emissaries around the Balkans to showcase Balkan gays that it gets better. These tours are followed by public relations campaigns of the respective embassies where the Western visiting gays are placed in this paternalistic position and they usually teach local gays how to be gay. In one such promotional video made by the U.S. Embassy in Kosovo called Judge Ted Weathers and Family Discuss LGBT Issues in Kosovo, we are introduced to the Honorable Theodore Weathers, his husband Teddy McCurchin, and their daughter Elizabeth. The family looks like something of a 1950s commercial. Terry is a money manager from San Diego, and he reminds the Kosovar gays that gay people have been born in every culture and every religion since the beginning of time. During a series of images of the U.S. ambassador, together with Ted, Elizabeth, and Terry, surrounded by LGBT activists during Pristina Pride, the video features Weathers extolling Kosovo for its new constitution, drafted as a gift primarily by USAID and EU lawyers, with a clause that protects LGBT rights. In another interview, given for the magazine and media outlet Kosovo 2.0, Withers argues, the folks here, quote, the folks here and the LGBT community are fearful. They are not out to their families and co-workers. It reminds me of where we were 30 years ago, personally and also in the US, when it was much more fearful thing to be openly gay. Things have changed so much, he argues, in the last 20 and 30 years in the U.S., and I suppose and hope that the same will happen in Kosovo." End quote. 
In Humanitarian Violence, Neda Tanasovsky points out how since the 1990s, one crucial task of U.S. nationalist liberal multiculturalism was to distinguish normative modes of inhibiting and representing diversity from aberrant ones, which could lead to tribalism and separatism of the kind witnessed in the former Yugoslavia, in Chechnya, but also here in Georgia. While projecting post-socialist countries as pre-modern societies stuck in ethnic and religious hatred and rooted in the failure of the socialist experiment, liberal multiculturalism emerged as the emblem of liberal democracy and as a sign of the end of racial and racist histories in the West. Alongside this portrait of integration, ethno-religious nationalism and conflict in post-socialist Eastern Europe portrayed the region as an anachronistic reflection of the West. This myth of Euro-American racial progress, articulated through the displacement of inter-ethnic violence onto post-socialist societies, does several things at once. On the one hand, it silences ongoing racist and homophobic violence at home, while on the other, it allows the EU and US to position themselves as neutral arbiters of human rights. Similarly, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the unification of Europe has promoted and projected the EU as post-ethnic, post-national, post-religious, post-racial entity through projects into former socialist states that seek to rectify these ills through market reforms. The danger of this discourse and the involvement of queers in them are manifold, as they not only promote and legitimize a specific sexual liberatory category, but also serve to separate and divide queer struggles from other forms of oppression, producing queers as the vanguard of progress and more modern than the communities they come from. These projects must always be framed through a stage of emancipation where the post-socialist audiences are made to seem idiotic and pathologized as senseless emotional suckers who can't seem to trade their instincts for reason, who can't seem to speak without a European looking over their shoulders. More importantly, responding to and accepting Euro-saving narratives means erasing and making invisible the ongoing EU violence on poor, migrant, queer, trans and disabled bodies of color left to die at its borders or actively pursuing their death in the peripheries of its cities. It allows the EU to project itself as a humanitarian power while the EU sets up external border prisons in Libya, Turkey, and Tunis, and Egypt, it evicts Roma communities from Rome, Paris, and Berlin, and detains and beats Balkan Muslims in Vienna, London, and Athens, all the while helping gays in Kosovo, in Bosnia, and Serbia, and Slovakia. Whom we align ourselves with here has a clear implication not just for ourselves, but for others. This is something that we should never lose sight of. All this said, I'm not here to deny the fact that homophobia and transphobia are rampant in most post-socialist societies, that queer people face daily harassment, discrimination, and violence. What I am trying to say is that our singling out of other marginalized groups for protection will not save us, nor it will be morally justifiable to seek our justice on the backs of establishing racialized others. This puts queer communities in a difficult and politically delicate position, but not a desperate one, as we are frequently told. For the political agenda of queer movements to be just, it must be therefore articulated from the margins and urgently decoupled from political projects that reinforce a confluence of sexual orientation with European orientation in the production of homophobic racial others. Struggles of sexuality are struggles of social and economic justice, and it will not come in a problem-solution imperative, packaged as a ready-made policy that doesn't seek to change misogynistic and homophobic worlds we live in, but to change queers and women to fit into the hetero-patriarchal structures. Moreover, it's important to remember 
that the racist populism on the rise and fascism all over Europe today is not an aberration of European expansion, but an extension of its fundamental governing grammar, rethinking a decolonial queer left as a viable, as a viable future is therefore a real and urgent task. But there is a problem here, because not all oppressed groups result in intersectional alliances, and this is something that got me thinking as I was walking with Paula today. Leftist movements in post-socialist spaces have sometimes been surly in their rejection of queer political movements as identity politics, as politics that obscure the real problem, that of class, it is not accidental that most of these political stances come from hetero men whose marginalization in the last 30 years has only been economic, but also because the role that socialist nostalgia has come to occupy in the post-socialist socialist project. We shouldn't therefore so much attach ourselves to socialist agendas, but rather reclaim, decolonize, and queer them. The goal here is therefore not to deny the fact that socialist premises and possibilities of decolonization, abortive and destructive as they turned out to be, but to rethink the multiple emancipatory perspectives from a queer decolonial position. This is a particularly necessary intervention in post-socialist spaces where racialization through queerness is not only cross-cut by gender, class, race and religion, but also, as I mentioned, bordering and borderland geo-embodied positionalities. It will allow queers in post-socialist spaces to close in on Euro-racism and its borders, as opposed to assist it in enacting those borders. Being targeted by saving industries puts queer communities in post-socialist spaces in a powerful political position, while at the same time making them vulnerable. For any movement that ascribes and aspires to emancipatory struggles, the choice should be clear. Not only we will not seek our liberation on the backs of others, but our movements should stem and speak the language of those impoverished margins, racialized, disabled and pathologized queer and trans people. This is crucial in an increasingly homonationalist global spiral. The sanctioning of queer subjecthood by the state, as Pouar brilliantly points out, is a historical shift in which we currently live in, and that it's a parallel process of demarcation from populations targeted for segregation, disposal, or death, a re-intensification of racialization through queerness. But things are perhaps not as bleak and desperate as I made them sound to be. Because there's also another historical shift happening. This one thinks to queer and decolonial praxis who have been mobilizing a movement to question homonationalist and pinkwashing agendas in the last decade. And the visibility of alliances once deemed impossible by the post-Cold War reorganization of the world around class and racial coordinates of developed semi-developed, underdeveloped. As I arrived in Tbilisi yesterday, Anano told me about the death of Temirlan Machalikashvili, a 19-year-old Muslim from Pankisi region who had been in detention by the Special Operative Department since December 2017. As I sat down in my room to research and read the details of the case, the setup seemed disturbingly familiar. Young Muslim men, detained under anti-terrorist raids, dies mysteriously. This could be the news right now from anywhere on the borderlands of Europe. Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia, Macedonia, Georgia, Ukraine. Muslim migrant Roma men and women have become the target of a new industry of incarceration, surveillance and violence, all under various EU and NATO bordering and securitization politics. Yet the presence at the protest last night of young Georgians coming together to bring salience and mark Temulan's death drew attention and attended to those forgotten 
battleground and borderland subjects at the front lines of the terror on war, yet simultaneously abstracted as metaphors and absent from the concern of the political, bringing back the issue and issues that are erased from the National Registry. Last night was one of the making and opening space of new vernacular solidarities after Europe and in the Commons. Thank you.